Bismillahirrahmanirrahim <coughs> Alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'uminu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina man yahdihillahu tabaraka wa ta'ala falamudillalah wa man yudlilhu falahadiyalah wa nashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika la wa nashadu anna sayyidana wa habibana wa shafi'ana wa sanadana wa maulana muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وعشيرته وأهل بيته وأصحابه وأنصاره ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسبة حسنة Respected brothers, elders, youngsters in our previous lesson, we spoke about the blessed lineage of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about all of his ascendants all the way from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam till Adnan. We began speaking about their qualities and we stopped at his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And it's very important we understand this because all of these sifat, all of these qualities were such qualities, all of these were found in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's why it's very important we actually understand this. Because the Arabs at that time, they possessed fantastic qualities. But despite possessing all these fantastic qualities, when it came to deeds, they were immorally corrupt in behavior. And in Amal as well, they were immorally corrupt. But they had special qualities. And the Arabs at that time, they had special supremacy over other nations. And I mentioned a few special qualities they had. Number one is they had uh, valor and heroism. Secondly, their generosity. They had such generosity that if any unexpected guest came to them, they were ready to slaughter a healthy cam camel that they possessed. And they would uh, offer it to the guest and sometimes it would come to such situation that they themselves would stay, stay hungry. And also apart from this number three, when it came to memory and intellect, they were very, very intelligent. They used to memorize poems after poems. And number four, their personal honor. They used to um, take a lot of pride and a lot of honor in their families, in their tribes, etc, etc. And number five, in terms of language, they were very, very eloquent in their language. And obviously we all know the Arabic language is eloquent as it is. Number six, they were very good in keeping promises. But despite possessing all of these qualities, they still had the other side to them as well, which we will talk about uh, briefly later on. What, were the, what was the religious state at that time? Before Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what was the religious state of the Muslims at that time? So it's very important we understand why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent to these kind of people. And why uh, Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was such a person who had fantastic character. When he came, he had flawless character. Why? So that he was enabled to rectify other people. Because obviously at that time, like I said, there was so much ignorant actions taking place, which we will touch upon later on. And there were many, many immoral acts taking place. So that's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And last week, if you remember, we discussed from Adnan all the way till Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was the reason why we spoke about them, because all of the lineage of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every single one of them, they possess special qualities, which we spoke about last, last week. They had special, special qualities, and all of these qualities collectively were instilled in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So today we will speak about the father of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whose name was Abdullah. Hafiz Asqalani, Allama Asqalani rahmatullahi mentions that there is no doubt that this was the name of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam's father. There is no ikhtilaf in that. Mawlana Idris Khandelwi rahmatullahi in his Mustafa, he mentions that it won't be far-fetched that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired Abdul Muttalib to name Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam's father Abdullah, which is the best of all names, which obviously we Realized from the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says, Ahabu al-asma'i ilallahi abdullah wa abdul rahman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's father the best of all names. 
In this hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the best of all names in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Abdullah and secondly is Abdul Rahman. And just on this, I thought a lesson we can't take is that we also give our children nice names, beautiful names also. That we give them, we give them names of sahabas, we give them names of sahabiyat, we give them names of, uh, of prophets and anbiya. And we give, give our children nice names. And you know, such is the you know, rewaj nowadays, we want to look at, you know, such, you know, names that just sound nice. Names that just sound very nice to people, we give them kind of names. Unfortunately, some people, what they do in uh, some cultures, they just open the Quran and any nice word, they, see, they think that this sounds nice, they'll name their children this name. Or they, you know, they look in the Urdu language, they'll pick certain words and they'll, uh, they'll give their children these names. I, start, I remember once he was telling us, uh, there's some people that he knows, uh, they were Pathan families and he was saying unke mein, you know, they had such names as like Pahar Khan, Suraj Khan, Chan Khan and they had these kind of names and he was just trying to teach us a lesson and he was just teaching us and he was saying you know we don't just give random, name, random names to people you know Deen and Islam teaches us to give beautiful names to our children and this is why Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu he mentions a beautiful narration of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa he mentions that the group of Sahaba, they came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we know the rights of children over, over the parents. That the, pa- that the children have to do khidmat of their parents, they need to do this, they need to look after them, etc, etc. What are the rights of the parents over the child? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa upon this, he mentioned that first of all, they give their children nice names. And then secondly, he mentions that we also do tarbiyat of our children. So the first thing he mentioned is that we give good names to our children. That even the name has an effect on a person's morality, on a person's akhlaq, that he is given a nice name. So that's why it's very important that we keep this in mind as well. That we give our children nice names. You know, Abdullah, Abdul Rahman, these are the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, as we're talking about this, the second point I want to mention is that when... We call people, we call them from the names properly. We say people's names properly. You know, we don't make shortcuts or we know we don't give nicknames and we don't make a habit of these kind of things. You know, sometimes unfortunately, we hear incidents, we hear stories about people. <coughs> when you talk to them about certain individuals, you say, do you know this person? They'll say, no, no, we don't know him. And then when you say to him, oh, his nickname was this, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that person. You know, unfortunately, people are remembered you know, through the nicknames, and they don't even know their proper names. Yeah. People have beautiful names like Muhammad, Ibrahim, Abdullah, they have these kind of names. Yeah. But we decide to give them nicknames. Yeah. I remember one of our ustads, every time he used to call every single one of us, you know, he used to say our names properly. He used to say our names properly, he used to say with Tajweed also. And you know, we remember this till today, and we respect that. Because Islam is such a deen, such a religion, it respects all the littlest of things. So that's why a couple of things we can't take a lesson from is that first of all we name our children with the best of all names and secondly upon this that we, we say the names properly. Moving on, <coughs> coming back to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's father Abdullah, uh, he mentions in, um, it has been mentioned that the light of Nubuwat was also visible in the father of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just like it was visible uh, in a couple of his ascendants which was mentioned two weeks ago it was also vi- visible in Abdullah also yeah. that the light of Nubuwat was visible on Abdullah's face and uh, after a little while Abdul Muttalib the father of Abdullah he sent a marriage proposal to Amina, who obviously eventually is the mother of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was the daughter of Wahab bin Abd Munaf. He sent a marriage ma- proposal for Abdullah. So Khair Amina, she accepted this proposal. The family, they accepted this proposal. And Ibn Abbas mentions whilst they were going for their marriage ceremony, as they set out, uh, they came across a lady. Uh, she, was a, she was a Jew, she was a Jew. And they came across this lady. When her gaze fell on Abdullah, she seen the light of Nubuat in his face. She seen the light of Nubuat in his face. So she beckoned him to, you know, come up to her and pleaded that I will compensate you with a hundred camels. As in she asked, she asked for such an act which is obviously haram. And she said, I will compensate you with a hundred camels. You know, Abdullah, he refused as we learned 
two weeks ago, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in the hadith that my lineage was the best of a lineage. Nobody committed any haram acts. Nobody committed any zina. So Abdullah obviously he refused. And he said, no, you know, how can, me, how can I perform such an act? You know, I'm going to get married. Khair. After this, he went uh, to Amina. He got married. After three days, whilst they were returning from the, uh, from the marriage with Abdul Muttalib, his father, they came across this lady again. And this lady, she asked, you know, where are you returning from? Uh, so Abdullah mentioned that we are returning from our marriage. I got married to uh, Amina and we are returning from our marriage. So she mentions and she clarifies that by Allah, I am not a woman of loose morals. I didn't want to commit any act of haram. The reality is my gaze fell on your face in which I seen the light of Nubuwad. All I wanted was that this was trans the nur was transmitted from your body to my body. That's all I wanted. That's it. You know, such was the face of Abdullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, through the barakah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who hadn't even entered the world yet. You know, this nur of Nubuwa was also in his father as well. Moving on, um, talking about the death of Abdullah. Um, he set out on a journey to Syria in a caravan and whilst he was going on the way, uh, Abdullah, the father of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa he got very ill due to which he had to stop in Medina Munawwara. He stayed in Medina Munawwara for approximately a month and he passed away in Medina Munawwara. And whilst the caravan obviously came back to Mecca, Abdul Muttalib wasn't aware of what had happened. So they told him about the situation that your son, he was left in Medina, he was ill, we don't know what's the situation. Khair, Abdul Muttalib sent one of his sons, Harith, the uncle of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa to Medina, he dispatched him to find out what's going on. And he found out that he had passed away one month after he was in this illness. His age approximately at that time, different uh, conflicting reports are mentioned. Some say he was 25, some say he was 28, some say he was 30. Uh, the most correct opinion is that he was 18 years old when he passed away. And this obviously at this time when Abdullah passed away, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the womb of his mother was in the womb of his mother. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa when he came into this, into this world, he came without a father because obviously his father passed away. Moving on, you know, this was Abdullah, the father of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa And moving on just before the birth of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa which I don't think we'll get time to touch upon, we need to know one of the main incidents that took place. Um, this was prior to about 50 days or 55 days before the birth of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa the story of the elephants took place and which and that year is known as the year of elephants the incident that took place in that year and we will briefly talk about this uh, story this incident that took place in short at that time uh, najashi was the king of abyssinia and najashi had appointed uh, abraha as a ruler of yemen so abraha was the ruler of yemen who eventually tried to uh, destroyed the Kaaba, he was destroyed later on. So Abraha was the ruler of Yemen. He found out that people are performing tawaf around the Kaaba. And he found out the Arabs in Mecca, they are performing tawaf around the Holy Kaaba. And he didn't like this, he disliked this. That how can people perform around the Kaaba, you know. So obviously jealousy and hatred came inside him. So he decided that he is going to erect a, you know, a magnificent building, a magnificent, magnificent, magnificent structure and he is going to build a church. So that people instead of doing tawaf around the Kaaba, they will come and do tawaf around his building, around his church that he is going to make. So had he prepared this uh, magnificent structure which is in a place called Maqam San'a, he prepared this. And the, you know, the building was you know, very very nice and the church was very very nice. Anyway, a few of the youngsters, they found out about this. So they decided, you know what, we're going to destroy this. There's two different narrations mentioned. One narration mentions that some people, they came and they, you know, they done some stool there and they fled away. Another narration mentions that some youngsters, they came, they lit a fire in the vicinity of where the church was. And they didn't actually burn the church. They lit the fire in the vicinity of the church. And that little blaze, it went it flew onto the building due to which the whole building collapsed and the whole building it burnt and it turned into ashes so obviously abraha he found out about this and this just angered him even more abraha got even more angry so he decided you know what 
I'm going to destroy the Kaaba. Obviously, he failed in his first attempt. So he thinks, you know what? Now I am going to destroy the Kaaba. Remember, this incident is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Fil. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fil. It's not mentioned in this much details, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned and done ishara towards this surah, uh, towards this in incident in Surah Al-Fil. And also to keep in mind when we, you know, when we do recite these surahs in namaz, you know, we should keep these incidents in mind. Khair. So Abraha, he left with his army for Makkah uh, to destroy the Kaaba and to eradicate the Kaaba. So whilst he was, you know, he was accompanied with a herd of elephants, this is why this is called the story of the elephants. So he was accompanied with a herd of elephants and whilst he went on the way, cutting the story short, he was uh, opposed by a few tribes, but obviously his army was, strong, was very, very strong. He defeated all those people who tried to protect uh, the Holy Kaaba. On the way, he defeated every single one of them. And whilst just before, he, when he reached Ta'if, he told one of his messengers, go and tell uh, whoever the leader of Makkah is. At that time, obviously, it was Abdul Muttalib. He said, go and tell him, uh, you know, we are coming. We are not going to do anything to you. We are going to destroy the Kaaba and don't come in the way. So Abdul Muttalib, he came to uh, Abraha and, you know, he spoke to Abraha. And he mentioned Abraha's, uh, Abdul Muttalib. He said to Abra Abra Abraha, said to Abdul Muttalib that, you know, we are coming to destroy the Kaaba. And at that time, Abraha on the way, whilst he was going to, to Makkah, he seized 200 camels of Abdul Muttalib. So Abdul Muttalib said to Abraha, give me my 200 camels back. And Abraha, he was surprised at this. He had so much respect for Abdul Muttalib in his heart. He says that I have lost all of my respect for you. Abdul Muttalib says, why? He says, because, you know, we are coming to destroy the Holy Kaaba, which is your place of worship, and you are more bothered about your camels. Upon this, look at the reply of Abdul Muttalib. He said, Abdul Muttalib said, that I am the owner of these camels, but the owner and the Lord of the Holy Kaaba is somebody else, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will protect the Kaaba. So then, after this, Abdul Muttalib Khair, he went back to Makkah and he told the people of the Makkah, okay, you know, uh, fled into the mountains. So the, all the people of Makkah, they fled to the mountains. And Abraha and a few other pious people, they made dua in front of the Kaaba. They made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, this is your house. You protect your house. So Khair, Abdul Muttalib also, uh, they also went away uh, from the Kaaba. After this, um, Abraha, he, start, he went forward with his army. And they, they obviously, they went to um, attack the Kaaba. And as Abraha's army proceeded ahead to demolish the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to demolish the Kaaba, huge flocks of small birds, they came with little pebbles in its claws, in its claws and beaks, and they pelted the army of Abraha with these bullets, with these little uh, pebbles they had in, in their beaks and in their, in their claws. They pelted these upon the army of Abraha, due to which every single one of them were destroyed. Uh, some did try to run away, but on the way they all, you know, every single one of them were destroyed. They tried to flee, but obviously they were destroyed because of the, uh, the power Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he put in these little pebbles, that there was such power in them, they were like lethal bullets. And every single one of them, they were completely destroyed, and they were completely wiped out. And Abraha's whole body, you know, it erupted with, you know, he had like wounds in his body. And one after the other, his limbs, they started falling to the, gr to the ground until his chest was opened up and his heart actually came out. This is the kind of death Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, you know, for trying to destroy the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After this, the army was destroyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a flood uh, that washed away all these people towards the sea. And obviously, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was protected and the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was looked after. Obviously, this is the incident of the elephants and a couple of lessons that we need to understand which are mentioned upon this story. First of all, we've got to understand that the people of that time, most of them were idol worshippers. But these people, they still had, you know, sanctity for the Holy Kaaba. They still had so much respect and honor for the Holy Kaaba, for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although they were idol worshippers, look how much respect and honor they had for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we can understand, whilst Abraha was going, so many armies, they tried to defeat Abraha because they knew he was going to destroy the Kaaba, which goes to show how much honor they actually had for the Kaaba. 
They had so much honor for the Kaaba. So these people, despite being idol worshippers, despite being, you know, uh, people who disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they had sanctity and they had love of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, for us to take a lesson as well, you know, even today when we go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we go there with utmost respect and we go there with utmost dignity. You know, if idol worshippers at that time can, you know, look after the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, respect the honor and dignity of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, today when we go as well, we should also respect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, unfortunately today, you know, we hear incidents about people that come back from Umrah and Hajj and what stories do they tell us that people around the Kaaba, they're taking selfies of themselves. Huh? They're making Snapchat stories and they're doing, they're doing this and they're doing that. This is what they're doing in front of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such a place, even the idol worshippers were respecting this place. Today, we as believers, as Muslims, we go there in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are doing such actions. Huh? That's why it's very, very important. You know, we take these lessons that we don't go there and disrespect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We go there, we sit with respect, we go with respect and we respect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second uh, point to mention, uh, the importance of this story is that this story is actually a sign of prophethood. How? Number one, had the Quraysh been defeated, had the Quraysh been defeated, and had Abraha, you know, been victorious upon them, they would have, Quraysh would have become slaves. And eventually what would have happened, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have obviously come in a, in, in, come as a slave into this world and he would have come in a family who were slaves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected, protected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And second sign is that these people, they were the people of the books. These people, uh, the Abraha's army, they were the people of the books. So in terms of uh, religiousness, they were more religious than, than Quraysh. Because most of them, they were all idol worshippers. But even then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted um, victory to the people of Quraysh. Why? Because a Nabi is going to come. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is going to come from their tribe. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defeated the army of Abraha, although they were more religious uh, they were more religious than these idol worshippers. But even then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed Abraha and the army. Why? Because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was going to come from this, from this qabila, from this... Uh, and then Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi mentions it is as if it was a message for the Quraysh that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, is safeguarding the Kaaba. Why? Because such a person who is going to come and he is going to, you know, become the keeper of the Kaaba. He is going to, you know, look after this place. So khair, anyway, this incident took place approximately about 50 to 50... The authentic thing is that about 50 days before, uh, before the birth of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And inshallah in our next lesson, we will actually touch upon the birth of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And just the last thing I want to talk about briefly is the religious state of the people at that time before Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Briefly, the state of, of the people at that time in terms of a religion, they used to, number one, they used to worship idols. They used to worship idols, different, different tribes. They used to worship different, different idols. Uh, so they used to assign partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these very same people, remember later on, they become sahabas. Later on, they become sahabas. But this just goes to show, you know, how far these people were in terms of akhlaq, ibadah, dealing with people socially, how far they were and how bad they were. You know, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took them out of all of this and made them amongst the best of all people. So how were these people? They used to worship idols. In terms of the Imaniyat, you know, in the Kaaba, there was approximately 360 idols at that time. In the Holy Kaaba, there was 360 idols before Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. When it, in terms of Ibadat, they used to do uh, Tawaf around the Kaaba naked. Without any clothes, they used to do Tawaf around the Kaaba. This is, you know, this was how far they were from Deen. And in terms of Akhlaq, they used to kill each other for fun. Dushman ko qatal karna, they used to kill each other over little, little incidents. And this one, you know, incident mentioned that a she camel, um, a she camel left its orchard, its garden, where it obviously used to stay, and it went into somebody else's garden. Uh, and that tribe was Ghaliban, it was a tribe of Kalib. And it went to, into, into his flock. So he found out about this. When he seen that somebody else's animal has come into his flock, he decided to kill that animal and he fired an arrow and killed it. He killed that animal. So Khal the Banu Taghrab, uh, who were the owners of the she camel, found out about this. 
So instead of you know discussing the matter, okay, you know pay us a ransom, give us the money for the Sheikh Kamal you kill. What did they do? They decided to start fighting with them. So they decide just over this one little Sheikh Kamal, which left the garden and went into another flock, they started fighting. And they started telling their children to fight with their... So Taghrab and Kalib, they both starting with fighting with each other. They told their families to fight with each other as well. And this enmity, it remained for 40 years. For 40 years, these two tribes, they just kept fighting with each other. Just because of one Sheikh Kamal, which had left, you know, which had left one, one person's flock and he went into another flock. Just because of this little reason, they carried on fighting for 40 years. This was their state. Uh, in terms of re religious. Huh? This is how far they were in terms of uh, their society. They used to bury their daughters alive. Huh? They used to bury their daughters alive. Imagine being buried alive. They used to bury their daughters alive with fear of poverty. And this was the religious state of the world before Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa came into this world. Huh? So imagine what type of change Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa had to actually make when he came into this world. Huh? And this is why it was important that such a Nabi you know, with such beautiful akhlaq, such great morality, such great akhlaq, you know, was to come into this world. And this all plays a part. Why is it important that we know all of these things? This all plays a part in us understanding, you know, uh, what type of changes Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa made when he actually came into this world. And, you know, what type of changes he made in all the people, you know, from people who are idol worshippers used to do bad things, used to do bad actions. You know, they became such people who, are, who became the flag bearers of Islam, you know, who were ready to, to go far and wide for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this was the state of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So inshallah, next week, we'll actually discuss the auspicious birth of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, we'll just go over this as well next week again. And we'll actually begin the, uh, the birth and the entrance of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to take lessons and to take heed from the life of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdulillahi wa